Well, hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 239 of Goulet Q&A. And uh, I got a, what, seven questions, eight questions, something like that. It'll be good, nice, nice pack Q&A for you here today. So today I'm gonna talk about MSRP and what that really means. Factory tours and giving more of them like I did with the Lamy one and me and Rachel's day-to-day -day, among other things So I thought that'd be kind of fun. Um, we haven't had a whole lot of stuff launched in the last week or so um, Pelican Edelstein Garnet came back. So that's fine um, We have a new Peniter ink alchemy set which as of recording this on Wednesday I don't know exactly when we're launching this, but it'll be very very soon. It's a rather sizely set for those of you who are into ink mixing. And it's kind of interesting because it's, it's like a premium ink mixing set. Now, I'm just gonna tease you with this because I do plan on going over it in right now, um, probably next week, maybe Wednesday or so. But uh, here is just kind of the basic deal. It is kind of your CMYK arrangement. So pretty much what happened, Dante Del Vecchio got really fired up about designing this um, for you and it explains a little bit about how it works and it gives you different formulas in terms of how much CMY or K, black, that you should mix in order to get a variety of colors. And essentially there's almost an infinite number of combinations depending on how you mix it. Um, but it's got all different kinds of arrangements you can do here and the ink alchemy is the mixing thing, alchemy, you know, and uh, comes with all those four colors, comes with really nice like perfume grade glass bottles very kind of fancy premium looking thing very nice presentation especially if it's anything that uh, you would want to present as a gift uh, it's got a pen filler as well as a snorkel as well so very cool very interesting and uh, not the kind of product you see coming out every day so um, it's also a little on the pricey side we're pushing three hundred dollars for this set so not exactly something that everybody's going to be interested in, but uh, I thought it would behoove us to give you some detailed information about how it actually works. So I have aspirations to use it this weekend and uh, play with it a little bit, though I'll be honest, a lot of times I've been inspiring to do things on the weekends and my family life has uh, required more of me than uh, I anticipated. So stuff gets delayed. So we're going to see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get that out for you maybe Wednesday next week and right now. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what's going on with that. So we'll have that soon. Um, we got some new style of uh, content that we put out this week. So we put out a pen battle video between Pilot Metropolitan and the Lamy Safari, which is always up for a healthy debate. Had Adrian and Colin join me both for that. So a new style, new location of video in our building and um, seems to be pretty well received so far. But if you haven't seen that yet, go check it out. If that style seems to go really well, we might mix in some other people, mix in some other pens. So we'd love some ideas as far as what we should have go head to head. That'd be kind of fun. That was basically a blog post that we kind of uh, turned into a video. And so we're kind of mixing it up a little bit and experimenting, trying to keep things fresh, you know, after almost uh, over nine years of doing this thing. Um, so uh, Whitney put together an MBTI Bujo blog. So anywhere you, any of you are familiar with the Myers-Briggs personality test, um, she did a really great job with that too. So uh, surprisingly accurate. So go and check that out. It's kind of interesting. Um, we do have the Esterbrook Evergreen coming out today. I believe it was just announced at the Philly show today as this video publishes. So that's pretty cool. You can check that out if you're into the Esterbrook, very vintage -y kind of looking thing. And the Pilot Vanishing Point Stripes, we should have that any day now, if we don't already. So um, there's some stuff on the horizon, but as I kind of mentioned last week, we're gonna be easing you into the new year here. We're not just dumping a ton of stuff on you. We have a lot of closeouts. We have a lot of good deals and stuff like that that are kind of still going on. So be sure to check out our closeouts page. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe because we're gonna have a lot more coming at you. Um, it's funny, we just put together a big presentation for our team just internally about how, you know, how many videos did we publish? How many ink samples did we make? How many, you know, this, that, and the other? How many orders did we ship? And all that's proprietary information, but the thing I'm very fun sharing with you is how many videos we published last year, which was 243 videos published. So we're over 125,000 subscribers now. We grew at about 44% here on YouTube last year, which is just amazing because we haven't really had one crazy thing that's gone viral. It's really just been the discipline of publishing video after video after video after video. And none of this would be possible without you all, of course, showing up and watching and actually caring that we're publishing all this stuff. So it continues to blow me away. We continue to build upon 
every year. We're at about 29 million total views for all the videos we've ever published. About pens, like it just blows me away and I'm super flattered and super honored to be a part of any of this. So that's really cool. So we're gonna get another one pounded out for you here today, talking about all kinds of various things. First pen and writing question I have is from Sammy QR on Facebook. What is preventing acrylic makers to emulate the Omas Arco Verde or bronze, or even the vacuumatic celluloid? Is there any other material out there that may emulate this at a reasonable price, which does not involve explosive compounds? Okay, so when you're talking about celluloid, you're talking about um, usually cellulose nitrate. Um, or cellulose acetate. Um, and um, cellulose acetate is a little less volatile than cellulose nitrate. Cellulose nitrate was like the, the old film that they used um, that was very, very, uh, well, explosive. I mean, it's flammable. It's an organic compound and it's combustible. Um, cellulose, celluloid in general, in its, in its official kind of capacity and what it's used for pens, is not very common anymore. In fact, there's very few um, companies that are even manufacturing it anymore today. It's kind of dying out. And part of that is because it is very hazardous to work with and it takes like two years for that stuff to cure. So you gotta store it, you gotta house it, you gotta have all these environmental regulations and you know fire safety and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's not the easiest stuff to work with. Um, so there are some of these vintage pen materials out there that you just don't see anymore. Um, and I guess, you know, the Omas Arcos would fall into that category now because Omas, at least in the form that it existed for 90 years, I don't know what form it's taking these days. I know it's kind of chopped up into bits and pieces and the name is kind of owned over here and there's some of the material that shows up over there and all that, but um, Omas in its former glory is no more. So the Omas Arcos, it's not, not around anymore and I don't believe the ability to make that material is possible anymore in its exact form because um, from what I understand, talking to a lot of the Italian pen companies is kind of like the one Italian celluloid manufacturer um, is not making it anymore. And that happened a couple of years ago. So all of the Italian pen companies are like hoarding all of their celluloid because they can't get any more of it. So it's like trickling out here and there into really, really special pens. So you'll see it here and there, but you're not going to see it in that affordable range like what you're looking for because it's just not available and that's what happens. Supply and demand, right? Um, so there are some physical properties of celluloid that allow for certain patterns and colors to really pop. I wish I was a chemist and I knew exactly why and how that was possible, but I don't know. It may be, I'm speculating a little bit and I've kind of asked around and you know, uh, you get into like proprietary territory here pretty quick. Um, and I haven't talked to the right people to know when you're talking about like the old Parker vacuumatic celluloids, like how exactly did they make that stuff? That was pretty closely held because obviously that was really special and it sold a lot of their pens. And so they're not gonna share that out very um, easily. You know, it's kind of a trade secret to manufacture that stuff. Um, in a modern form, I do have a few pens that can kind of emulate that or you know, are very close to that. You know, we had a pen a couple of years ago. This is the Visconti Manhattan Wall Street. This is an exclusive that we had. It was limited because we had limited by the material. Um, this is also the Visconti Wall Street. So this is the, you know, uh, squared circle version of it in a green. And then we recently came out with the Montegrappa Shiny Lines, which is a similar kind of pattern, not exactly the same, but it goes long ways instead of the other way. So um, with this type of material, this is what you're talking about with the um, the vacuumatic celluloid looks more like these Wall Street versions where it's a little bit translucent. There's like translucent layers and then there's like shiny layers. And what happens, this is basically a stacked celluloid. So what happens with these is they they cast it into very thin sheets or they can cut, you know, thicker sheets and then they put different layers like a translucent layer and then a, a silver layer or whatever and then translucent silver, translucent silver. And depending on which orientation they have it when they want to drill through it, they can get different, different patterns, not dissimilar to when you're working with wood. And I used to turn pens out of wood and it was the same kind of thing. It's like the grain of the wood, which direction is it going? You know, this is more like a cross grain kind of configuration where you see all the layers stacked up like this. Whereas something like this Montegrappa is 
um, you know, more of the long grain, if you were. So the effect you get this is looking at it in one orientation, you see all these tiny stack things vertically, and then when you turn it, it looks like a wood grain, and you see these kind of arcs. This is the more of the configuration of the Omas Arco that you're, you're asking about. Um, so there is, a, there is a physical, like, chemical component to some of these vintage celluloids, and then there is a mechanical component, which is like, how do you actually cut up, slice up, and arrange these things? And the thing I'll say about this is not only is the material expensive, but to actually do all this, you can't just cast one big blob of this. Um, it's a lot of work, and it takes a lot of time to stack all this up together. And then your risk of you know, blowing it out when you're manufacturing it is much higher. The defect rate is much higher, so your waste is going to be higher. It's, it's, that's why you see this stuff so expensive. So the truth is, I don't know a way, personally, where you can manufacture something like this in a fashion where it can be what you would consider to be affordable or more affordable in that way. I mean, it, it's all relative, of course, but like the most affordable version of it I've, I've seen has been when, when we did this um, Manhattan Wall Street, which this was still $595. So I would not consider that to be like, a bargain basement price, but for what it was, it was a really good price and we were happy to do it. That's why we jumped all over it um, when we had the opportunity. But when we get into something in this territory to have it in the $800 range was like phenomenal. Um, most of the celluloids that you're going to start to see in the next several years, I think are going to be in the 800 to 1000 on up into the two and three and $4,000 because it's really rare and special stuff you're not going to be able to get anymore. So I think you're going to see companies like Monograppa and all them, they're going to come out and save these last few rods of celluloid they have for their very high-end limited editions. That's what's going to be more common. So you're going to have to move towards alternatives uh, to get more affordable. Uh, one pen that's an example of that, it's not exactly priced as a bargain like this, but this is kind of an experiment, if you will. Um, Dante, in his uh, genius, dreamed up um, an, a new version of Arco. So he helped to formulate and design uh, the Peniter Arco. So the pen is called the Peniter Arco, and it is very much meant to emulate kind of that Arco bronze. And it's a uh, it did a pretty darn good job. And what was interesting when I was talking with Dante about how he designed this, it doesn't go perfectly straight up and down. It's actually at a four degree angle. He intentionally designed it to be tilted at a four degree angle and manufactured that way so that you see the arc effect. Because if it was just straight up and down, you would see this pattern. I don't know how well you can see that, but you would see, it's not too bad. You would see how it's kind of shiny like here, like you got these dark lines that alternate in between these kind of coppery, sparkly lines. And this kind of comes up, goes into an arc, and then comes back down. Well, that's because it's cut at an angle like that. If it wasn't cut at an angle, you would basically see this shiny part go straight up the whole pen, and you wouldn't see it a whole lot unless you did a crazy curve. I could go on to wood turning and when you do turned objects, the different configurations you can get, especially I'm a woodworker and wood turning is like my favorite thing because it's so interesting what happens with grain patterns and stuff like that when you turn objects and change the orientation and stuff. It's fascinating things can happen. Um, and that's kind of what uh, Dante was trying to get out of the design of the Peniter Arco. So this is uh, going to be the closest thing I can see that has emulated uh, kind of like a, a more vintage celluloid. Um, of course, they're, uh, I think of like the Armando Samani Club. They have some, I believe they um, have some of the old Omas Arco. I don't know that for a fact, but it looks exactly the darn same. Um, and, um, you know, again, they're not making any more of it, so I don't know how long that's going to be around. Um, and I don't know anyone else who's making that style anymore. I would love to see it if you're aware of it. Post in the comments because I would love to kind of be in the know as far as that stuff as it's kind of popping up. Um, but from those I've talked to in the business, um, that is a challenge. You know, another interesting thing about these types of materials, um, most of the um, cellulose acetate resins that you're seeing, which is what you see with like Edison pens, you know, the premieres that we have, um, you know, this one as an example. So this was our premier Galaxia. This was from our, our seasonal that we did last year. This is an acrylic acetate. So it's a very different, I mean, it looks similar, but it's a different type of material than 
the cellulose nitrates or cellulose acetate. And um, this uh, is not something that is uh, very easy to make either, but it's not nearly as hazardous and it doesn't take as long to cure and it's not as um, fire hazardous uh, as the cellulose nitrates were. So um, this type of material is actually commonly used in other industries more so than in the pen industry. Um, in the pen industry today, when companies need to mass produce pens and do it at a very low cost, injection molding is by far the cheapest way to do it. That's what you see with your Platinum Preppy, for example. But there's a lot of other pens. They're injection molded or at least have injection molded components to them. As soon as you get into any type of cast resin material like you have with a cellulose acetate or any of these celluloids, uh, the price is immediately going to go up because the manufacturing process is so different. You know, you're talking about casting into a large sheet or blocks, cutting it up, drilling through it, and you're milling and drilling on a lathe a single pen at a time, as opposed to an injection molding machine where you can have, you know, basically as many pens as you want made at a time, 8, 10, 20 pens at a time, and it just injects plastic into it. And then it, you know, you can, you can have different types, uh, PVD or various other um, types of plastics that can be injection molded, and you can basically just run a machine and they crank them out all day long takes a couple of minutes to make the bodies for one of those pens. So your cost can be much lower. The investment, the initial investment is much higher, but the cost is much lower. And you can just melt it down into pellets and it's very simple. Um, whereas to get certain patterns and certain materials um, to do like this one is, a, is like a crushed uh, uh, material. And you can see celluloids and stuff that have had this kind of crushed material like this Galaxia, like that. So you have different colors of resin and it's, uh, you basically kind of crush it up into pieces, recast it into a block, and then you get this different color variation. You can do that with swirls, and there's all kinds of kind of proprietary techniques. Doing cast resins like this is really almost like its own art form. And I haven't witnessed, I've never toured a resin making facility. I've toured an injection molding facility, and I've seen like rods of celluloid and stuff. I haven't seen too much of the raw manufacturing of cast materials like this. Um, but I've done some casting of, of um, like alumalite resins, sort of like what you see with the Herbert pen that we just did. Um, we still have a few of those left, the Herbert Monument Liberty. Um, so I've, I've done some casting uh, with that type of material before uh, myself, but uh, that's easy to do in kind of a one-off. To do this kind of stuff is, it's its own art form. So you end up with manufacturers who are in the cosmetics industry, who are in the eyewear, like to make glasses. Um, that's where you get a lot of this kind of stuff, um, is, uh, is in those industries, which are much larger industries worldwide than fountain pens, if we gotta be honest. There's way more people uh, wearing eyeglasses than there are using fountain pens, right? So um, what ends up happening is there are, you know, a few major manufacturers that make this type of material. They sell it out through all kinds of industries, the pen industry being one very small part of the global industry that might need these types of materials. Um, they come up with all kinds of designs. They can do custom stuff, um, but you gotta do it in a certain volume, right? So if you're looking, if you're a smaller pen manufacturer and you're looking to do something that looks very much like a vintage material and you're having to design it more or less from scratch, um, you're gonna have to buy a certain volume if it's even possible to do it and it just might not make sense in the volumes that they need and I'm talking like you would need to make thousands of pens for this kind of thing and is that gonna be popular enough who knows um, it, a lot of these manufacturers will have kind of stock materials that they'll offer which is more off-the-shelf kind of thing but it's not gonna be anything that so directly emulates like vintage pens because again that's not their primary market most likely so all this to say, it's, it's probably possible to emulate some of these things, but to do it affordably, to do it at scale, I just don't know how realistic that is anymore given the state of the pen industry and, and just kind of where it's at in general and where manufacturing is. I don't know, it might kind of just be a sign of the times of where we were at in that heyday of vintage pens. And for those who are able to kind of custom build and come up with these things, they're going to be very expensive because it's going to be a passion project. It's going to involve an inordinate amount of time uh, that's just going to have to uh, pay itself back at some point. But 
you know, that's why something like the Paniter Arco, it's still an $800 pen. It's not an absolute bargain, um, but it's a material that Dante has dreamed up and designed with his 30 years of experience in the pen industry um, because he wanted specifically to go for that look. So that might be the kind of thing that we see is the celluloids might just disappear and not be available at all. And then to come up with alternative materials, the price still may stay a little higher, but I could be wrong and I hope that I am. That's just kind of where I think we're at right now. Okay, nice long first question. I went on a roll there. Um, so let's get off of pens. Let's talk about ink for a little bit, okay? So first question I have is from DUDG on Facebook. What is the difference between J. Herbin and Herbin inks? Any reason for the name and bottling variation? Okay, so yes, there is a reason. Um, it requires a little bit of explanation. The reason I wanted to take this question now is because we're talking about it actively here at Goulet Pens because they are undergoing a branding change and it's kind of a rolling branding change. So we have actually just gotten some clarification even this week from uh, Execlair, who is the US distributor for Herba. And they have said, hey, this is their intention to do a branding change. So they've been going through some transitions. 10 years ago, everything was just J. Herbaum. It was a 30 mil bottles of ink. They had their calligraphy line. They had their fountain pen ink line. And it largely wasn't much more complicated than that. They then came out with the 100 mil inks and then they had the 30 mils and they have little tester samples. And then they came out with the 1670 line, which started out with just Rouge Hematite. And then they came out with Blue Ocean. And then they came out with Stormy Gray, Emerald of Shavor, Corlinde, Egypt. Uh, and now uh, they have the 1798 line. Sorry, Cortland, Cornaline de Egypt is a 1798, not a 1670. My apologies. Um, and so they have a couple different looking bottles, a couple of different um, names that have been going out there. So basically, um, the old branding was Jerobon. That's my Verat Olive. It's got the J there. And the new Violet Pense. Oh, come on now, camera. Violet Pense is just Erbon. Come on. Get there. Um, it's just Erbon. Okay, you get the idea. So they're changing the branding over. For these ones, that's, that's really about it, the 30 mils. They don't look vastly different. It's just they're dropping the J. Same thing with um, their sealing wax, right? So I have a sealing wax here. Um, the old red one that I have has the J on it. The new copper one that I have is just Erbon. Uh, and for this kind of stuff, like we've got the picture, the product is still the same. It's going to perform the same and all that. It's just a little bit of a branding, a little bit of aesthetic change. When we end up with that and we see, we start to receive products in. Actually, let me put a pin in that and come back. So I'll talk about the branding rollover change. Remind me. You can't, but I'm reminding myself. Um, so that's the 30 mils, that's the wax. There might be some other stuff because we don't carry every Herbon product, so we might see some other things roll through. And believe me, I have to like intentionally think like it's not J. Herbon, it's, it's just Herbon now. <laughs> because for the last almost 10 years, I've been referring to it as J. Herbon. But now it's just Herbon. So um, 1670 and the 1798. So I believe what's happening is they are moving away from the old 1670 bottle which I'm not really crying about because um, it's a beautiful bottle, but it has this tiny, tiny little hole in the top of it that is actually difficult to fit a lot of your pens into. And I can only show you but so well. So it's a tiny little hole and it doesn't really fit all, all pens so well. So now they are moving all of these 1670 bottles to be in the 1798 bottles, okay? So it's the same volume of ink and overall the aesthetic is not not that different, but they are gonna put the name on the front of it. So um, the old bottle, the general shape is the same, um, but rather than having just that, they have the nice label on the bottom and they widened up the cap and, uh, and the opening as well. So I'll try to show you, I'll try to show you both um, without completely dumping ink all over my desk. But you can see there a little bit just how different it is. I don't have the exact measurements of the necks of these bottles, but you can see there, it's pretty significant. And especially with just how thin the 1670 bottles were, um, it's a very noticeable and very welcome difference between the size there. And then of course they're changing the name, the branding from J. Herbin to Jacques Herbin. So J. Herbin stands for Jacques Herbin. 
Um, but now they're taking the 1670 and the 1798 lines of ink, and they are turning that into more of like a premium line, which they really were anyway. The pricing was different and it was different branding to begin with. But now instead of everything being Gerbon, they have Herbin, and then they have Jacques Herbin, which is gonna be their premium line. So uh, word on the street is that they are going to um, be doing some other premium Jacques Herbin stuff. I don't know whether it's just ink, pens, or whatever, um, but I, I hear that they might be testing some of that uh, over in France right now. I don't know what the state of that's going to be. I don't know if we're going to see that in the U.S. at any point, but I think that's part of the intention is they're just at a point in their company's history where they want to do a branding change, and they're in kind of a rolling stage where that's, that's happening, that's rolling out. Now think about it, Jerry Arban, uh, formerly Jerry Arban, so he just did it, Arban has now been around for 349 years. So the reason they have the 1670 ink is because that's when the company was established, was in 1670. I mean, that's a long time ago. Look, Victor Hugo was using their ink, you know? It's crazy how old this company is. So just imagine how many changes and how different their branding has been over 349 years. So here we are crying about it's different than it was 10 years ago. 10 years to them is like, whatever. You're like barely even have taken a breath and let it back out after 10 years. So what we're dealing with now is we now have two separate lines and um, we're in a rolling change. So when something like this happens, they sell out all of their old stuff you know, and stuff sells at different paces, right? Like, I don't know how many total SKUs that Jerobon has, but we have at least 50 ourselves. Probably more than that, actually, and especially when you consider ink samples. So we have easily over 100 when you count ink samples. So when they change the name, like the products themselves perform the same, they just look a little different, the branding is a little different. But when they come out with this rolling change, it always wreaks havoc on us because we don't know what we have, <laughs> you know? Especially because the ink comes sealed in a box. Now, thankfully these are, you know, you can tell these two look pretty different, right? Um, and most everything is pretty easy to tell what it is, but um, sometimes that's not always the case, like when a pen has a tweak that changes, but the outer packaging is the same. It's hard for us to know. Um, this one is a little bit easier, but even still, um, it's not always such a clean cutoff for us on the website, especially because we take our photography and we take it and then we try and do a really good job. But when there's a rolling change like this, we don't necessarily know when to cut off and put up the new image and take it down, all this kind of stuff. So that's why when you see changes like this start to happen, we'll usually just put a disclaimer saying they're going through a rolling change and you might receive one version or the other. If we can, we'll try to put up a picture that's the new and the old version and say, you're gonna get a one of these. <laughs> um, and then if you have a special request, we'll try to honor it if we can. These, we can probably do okay. Other things is more difficult for us to do. So we never absolutely promise it, we'll do our best. Usually what we'll say is, can I please get the new version? Or can I please get the old version? We'll try to pick that out when we pick it off the shelf. Um, but it's not so easy, especially because sometimes what happens, and I don't know yet, because this is a new change and things are starting to roll over. Sometimes what will happen is, you know, a company like Erba will make a change. So they'll still have a bunch of Emerald of Chavor. I'm just using that as an example. They'll still have a bunch of that. So that change hasn't happened yet. But Coraline de Egypt, that's in the new one or whatever it is. That one didn't change actually, but you know, it might. So they're going to rebrand it, whatever. So uh, let's use 1670. So they have 1670 and that one is is not changing yet because they still have plenty of the old one. But you know what? Rouge Hematite sells a lot faster or whatever and they didn't have as much of it or whatever it might be. So that, that they're shipping. So when they ship out a shipment to the US, they get a whole bunch of old Emerald of Chavor and a whole bunch of new Rouge Hematite and that's what comes to the US. Well, guess what? That goes to the distributor. The distributor has their own stock levels and guess what? When they ship it to the retailers, the retailers have their own stock levels. So it takes often sometimes a year, maybe two years, depending on how much stock is out there and how fast stuff is selling through for you to be able to confidently say, okay, now there is no more of the old version, it's only the new version. So we're gonna end up being in this situation for some time and we can't confidently say it's all new branding for at least a year, I'm just calling it now. Um, but for us, thankfully this stuff sells through 
pretty decently. Um, but it's still, it might take us a while. We have no idea. It depends on how much the manufacturer has, how much, how much the distributor has, how much, how much we have on our shelves. So uh, I'm at least letting you know kind of what the variances are with these, how that kind of happens, and what maybe you can expect moving forward. Um, but that's just kind of where we're at. Eventually, it'll all be rolled over. But, um, you know, it's a little little piece of ink history. And as you're, if you're newer into this hobby, you know, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I have one of the old bottles that has the J on J or Bond. And that's kind of neat. And it looks a little more orange. That could be from Sun Damage. But no, I think it was just a little more orange. Um, and then you get to hold on to that. And you might be one of those people that you have these two bottles next to each other and you're like, that makes me want to rip my eyes out because it looks different. Or I am more of the mentality where it's like, yeah, I got history here. I remember when. I bought this back when. And uh, it just becomes a little piece of historical evidence that you have on your shelf. So I don't know. That at least explains kind of what's going on. Next question I have is from Perficone on Instagram. I did find or sorry, I often find the color of the ink changes considerably depending on how long it's been in the pen and which pen it is in. This change is usually for the worse. The color is not nearly as nice. Any way to alleviate this? That's interesting because I actually like the way most colors look after they've been in the pen for a while, but that's just me. That's my personal preference. We're seeing that you have a different preference than me. So what is actually happening? Why? If you're doing nothing, is the ink just magically changing color in your pen? Um, so most often what's happening here is the water in the ink, because ink is mostly made of water, about 70% or so, um, and it is evaporating. It's evaporating out of the pen. And the reason it's happening differently in every pen is because, well, every ink is different, but also every pen seals up differently. So some pens are airtight, air sealed, and will last for a long time. I think specifically about... Uh, platinum with their 3776 century knit pen. They have their slip and seal cap as they call it. Um, so it is a cap with a spring mechanism in here and it is designed to fit and mate very tightly and um, they say that it is to stay completely like nib wet and no ink evaporation for two years which is a very long time. In fact, probably it's perfectly sealed and what's happening over two years, you're gonna to start to see a little bit of evaporation just because the water is actually going to leach through the resin over that long of a period of time. Um, you know, it can happen very slowly. If you ever had ink cartridges, that's a different type of plastic than what you see on most pens, um, but that is a more breathable plastic. If you've ever had ink cartridges that sit around for six months, a year, several years, you'll notice that the ink level appears to go down even though it's inside a sealed cartridge cartridge. It's the same kind of thing. If you took one of those sealed cartridges and you, uh, the, the ink level was lower and you pop one of those in your pens, it's going to write so much darker and so much more saturated than it would a fresh cartridge. And that's exactly the same kind of idea of what's happening inside your pen. And it's going to vary a little bit. It's going to vary depending on the pen. It's going to vary depending on the ink. It's going to vary depending on your relative humidity in your air, your climate, where you store the pen. If it's in sunlight, it's going to evaporate faster. You know, there's a lot of different factors that can happen. Um, but basically, the bottom line is, if the ink is sitting there for a period of time and the water evaporates out, the dye is going to stay behind. The water is going to be less, so you're essentially going to have a less watered down version of your ink. So it's gonna be a more concentrated version of that ink. So that means it's gonna flow a little differently, probably a little drier, and it is going to um, look deeper. The dry time is gonna be longer and it's gonna be darker, more saturated in color, maybe heavier, sh sh heavier sheening if there's a sheening property to it. Um, and it might smear a little bit more, these types of things. Um, might be a little harder to flow through your pen and you might, uh, you might have to clean it out. Um, so what can you do if you're in this situation? Well, if it, it's not too bad and it hasn't happened much, sometimes if you have a pen sitting around for a while, for example, I had this pen sitting around for months. So this is my Opus 88 Fantasia. Um, I had it sitting nib up with um, Diamine Oxblood in it and it was mostly air and just a little bit of ink and the nib was completely dried out because that's what I like to do with my pens is I like to leave them sitting until they dry out and then I clean them. Um, but uh, what I did to get this thing going again is I got a little cup of water. I literally just did this this morning. So I got a little cup of water um, and I, sorry, just a little Dixie cup. I put some water in it and I just kind of like, you know, 
took around here and did this. If, if it's relatively recent and it's not too bad, you know, if, you're, if your pen is just sitting there like that, like all the, all the ink is gonna wanna work its way through the nib and the feed. Um, and so when it's evaporating, that's where it's evaporating out of first. So the ink that's inside the pen is gonna be more of the original ink. Um, and then the, what's in your feed is gonna, is gonna dry up. Um, is going to dry out first. So you might still be able to save it at that point. So you just kind of, you know, get it wet, get it in here. Some people lick their pens. I don't like to do that personally, but whatever, it's your preference. I wouldn't, but it's, it's up to you. Um, and that can kind of resaturate it. Now it might be a little watery when you start to first write with it, but it can kind of get it going again. If you happen to write with it and you're like, oh, this color is not great. You might be able to kind of water it down and get it flowing again, and then you might be okay. Another thing you can do if you've got like half the ink that's left in here is you can just go and fill the pen again. You know, you don't want to necessarily dump it back into the pen, I mean, into the bottle. I mean, if you've got half a milliliter at the most inside your cartridge converter pen, for example, and you dump it into a 50 milliliter bottle of ink, is a, is a slightly different concentration of ink in half a milliliter going to affect 50 milliliters? you're not really going to notice it quite honestly. So you can do that. Or what I would do is um, if you have like a cartridge converter pen, I'm trying to look for a cartridge converter pen. I'm short on cartridge converter pens right at the moment. Um, I have a Banu here, Banu Hexagon. Just talked about these right now on Wednesday. So if you got a cartridge converter and it's half filled with ink, you can turn it up, you can expel the air out of it and then just suck new ink up into the pen, it'll kind of mix with your old ink and it'll make it look more like the original. So that's another thing you can do. So you can use a little water to kind of clean it and dilute it again. You can suck new ink back up into it and kind of resaturate it again. Or you can basically complete, clean the whole pen out and re-ink it back up. If you're just cleaning the pen out of the ink and putting the same ink back in it, you don't have to get super detailed about cleaning it out. All you need to do is flush it a couple of times you know, and then take a paper towel to it, kind of suck the excess water out of it, fill it back up, and that's about it. It takes like 30 to 45 seconds, tops, to do all that, and then you are good to go. Um, but again, it's entirely subjective as to whether you can do this. If you really want to try to avoid it, you can get pens specifically, um, and I got a couple here just to kind of call out. Um, the Platinum 3776 Century is really good. Any pen that has an insert in the inner cap is going to be better about this, like Twisby, their 580, pretty much most of the Twisbys have this feature, a little cap insert. Same with the um, Pilot Custom 74 and the Custom 823. You're seeing the same thing. It's got this little insert. And uh, let me see if I have a rubber band handy. I can show you. Here we go. I can show you what this insert actually looks like. Uh, let's see here. So this is a little trick that I like to use. I just wrap a rubber band around the end of a pencil, and I can pull that insert right out of there. Most pens, the insert. Some pens, the insert is kind of screwed into the pen. Other ones, it's not. So this um, insert, when the pen is inside the cap, just goes in here and covers it just like that, and that is going to keep your nib from drying out, keep your ink from evaporating out of the pen and you are on your way. So there you go. Also, if you happen to have a demonstrator pen like this and ink gets behind the insert, you can use that little trick to get in there. There's your little Easter egg for watching so far into this Q&A so far. And I'm only on the third question and I'm 38 minutes in. What in the world? Let's move on, shall we? All right, I got a couple of business questions here. One is from Colors and Beads on Instagram. What is the point of MSRP? if all retailers have the same discounted prices? And should that one be the MSRP? Great question. I thought this would be super interesting, especially for those of you who are not in the business or in retail. I don't know how it works in all retail scenarios. I'm just gonna be talking from my practical experience, especially operating in the pen world as an online retailer. So take everything I say with a grain of salt, but with 10 years of experience doing my thing. Okay, so MSRP stands for Manufacturer Suggested Retail Price. And really that's all it is. It's just the manufacturer saying, hey retailers, you should sell this pen for this much. You know what I mean? And that's about it. So Edison has one, Visconti has one, Pilot has one for every single product. And all they're saying is we think in the marketplace that this product should be positioned to sell for X. And it could be different by region, you know, because our currencies are different and, you know, the economies of scale are different in different regions. And 
certain taxes are higher in certain areas. So the MSRP is often set different in different locales. You know, for example, you can buy a lot of Japanese products cheaper in Japan than you can in the US and certainly in Europe. A lot of that is because you have to ship the products further. It's harder to service them. There's language barriers. There's marketing regulations and all kinds of other things that are different in other regions. So MSRP is set differently depending on the region. Um, the MSRP price that manufacturers put out is what's known as full retail, right? So it's what you'll often see in print advertisements at, you know, company like official corporate stores for most brands, flagship retailers and the like, because that's what they want to really get out there as this is the, this is the full retail price. Uh, manufacturers often set their wholesale price off of that MSRP. So the price that I will pay as a retailer will be a ratio or be a percentage of the full MSRP. They cannot dictate what I sell something for. There's, there's literally laws in place in the US at least that say that a manufacturer cannot set prices that a manufacturer actually sells something for. But what they can do is they can have something called MAP pricing, which is minimum advertised pricing. So a brand can say, you guys can sell for whatever you want. This is what you're char we're charging you, right? You're going to buy it at this. We recommend you try to sell it at this so that you can make a proper margin and represent our brands well, but you cannot publicly advertise it below a certain price, which is usually somewhere in between, right? And the reason that they do that map pricing is because if you see prices all over the place, you're confused. You're like, why in the world is this retailer selling it at this price? This one's selling it over here. It's all over the place. It seems like the same product. I don't know what's going on. This is really confusing. And almost always we're going to default to thinking that, well, the MSRP is, is clearly they're just trying to gouge us right? Like they're clearly trying to gouge us. And so the lowest price, that's what it really should be. Everybody else is just trying to scam you. Well, the crazy thing is the, usually the lowest price, if you scour the whole internet and you look and see the lowest price, it could be a single person running a business out of their garage that doesn't understand anything about how to run their business that I'm not saying this is the case always, but it could be that they don't know anything about running their business or they're trying to blow it out and they don't care about making any money back. They're selling it below their cost. And it's out there on the internet. And it seems like, oh yeah, you know, a Pilot Custom 823, why does Goulet have it for 288 when this person's got it for $79? I don't know that that's the case, but if you see, you could see that much of a discrepancy and you're like out there on the internet and there's algorithms on various marketplaces now that will put the lowest price at the top. And you're like, in your mind, in your psyche, in the marketplace, that model is now valued at $79. You're looking $288. This pen is not worth that. Well, poor pilot over there is like, we're trying to make this, we're trying to position the product in the marketplace. We're trying to invest and build brand and, you know, earn profits to reinvest back into developing new products and things like that. But if the perception of our brand in the marketplace is that this pen is only worth $79, they are going to, over the long term, suffer as a result. So they put minimum advertised pricing in place so that you don't have just mass confusion about a given brand or a given model out there in the marketplace. So you'll still see plenty of that going on um, with various prices all over the place, but oftentimes it is in violation of the minimum advertised price or you'll see it with people who are selling outside of the domain of whatever MSRP rules are set in place. So you might see this, and this is really something that's kicked up in the last 10 years or so since e-commerce has become unignorable, where you'll see somebody that's selling overseas to a different region. They're shipping, there's different export rules and regulations and stuff like that, but they might be operating within the MSRP of their locale, or they might be intentionally trying to sell to a different locale where they're a little more rogue and there's a gray market around this kind of thing where they don't really have to abide by an MSRP rule. You know, using, um, uh, I'll use Pilot as an example, just kind of pick on them. Not pick on them, but this might happen because they're a very large company and they have subsidiaries across the world. But if there is a US market price for this and there's minimum advertised price with MSRP and all that stuff set for us because we operate in the US, there might be somebody in another region in the world that doesn't 
buy through Pilot USA, they buy through another Pilot subsidiary, but they might be marketing and shipping their product to the US. And that gets very challenging for a company as large as Pilot to try to control because on the internet, you never know whether somebody's got a huge warehouse or whether they're just one person with one product or no product even advertising in their garage. And yet they appear to have all this stock and be selling all these things and you never really know and it gets really confusing and can cause a big stink. Uh, and you see Reddit threads all over the place and you see posts in Goulet Nation about this thing is priced this over here and everybody gets all confused and worked up. So it's an effort for companies to try to get some handle on where their brand is in the greater marketplace because it's really kind of guerrilla warfare out there every day when you're a manufacturer trying to price your products in the greater marketplace. There's a lot of noise out there and that's some way to try to get their hands around it. Um, let's see here, I'm jumping all over the place. I, I put out a bunch of notes here because I wanted to be very thorough. Um, so I talked about map pricing. Yes, so that's why you'll see the minimum advertised price. That's why you'll see a price that's below MSRP um, that it seems to be kind of a standard across uh, at least most retailers, especially authorized retailers who are trying to respect the map pricing. It's not necessarily that the no one, it's not that the MSRP doesn't matter. It's just that in, especially in the e-commerce online marketplace, the competition is very stiff. So it tends to drive towards the lowest price. Simple economics, supply and demand. When you have a lot of competitors and you have a lot of product that's available out there, the price tends to go down, right? Because there's a lot of supply, less demand, price tends to go lower. So without a floor in place, like a minimum advertised price, it would go down until it would hurt the brand and retailers would not be profitable and start to go out of business and then crazy things would start to happen and yada, yada, yada. Um, you know, what is interesting is, is you tend to see the full retail MSRP more like brick and mortar stores, I'm thinking like department stores and, and places that are larger, not as, you know, deeply plugged into the community where, you know, believe it or not, not everybody spends hours a day on fountain pen forums and fountain pen websites cruising around and seeing who's got the lowest price and da 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 da. Yes, a lot of you do, and that's very common for if you're deep in the hobby. But casually, somebody who's just browsing and all that, they're gonna go to whatever their closest store is or wherever they happen to see it or whatever, they may not be as sensitive to it and they may require more education on their front. So if there's somebody's going to a brick and mortar store, I don't know anything about pens. Why would I choose this fountain pen over that one? And they may spend two hours there because they require all the explanation and salesperson's time. Usually you're gonna get full retail. They might ink up the pen and do all those kind of things. They might pick it up, they might drop it on the floor. And so there's more, there's usually more of a full retail kind of scenario at brick and mortar stores because it's a lot of work. And I've worked retail, not in the pen world, but I've worked retail in other stores before. It's a lot of work. You're on your feet all day, it's tiring, etc. Not that we don't work hard here too, obviously, but it's, it's different. So when we're in an online scenario, obviously there's much more kind of automation. You're doing a little more of your work by researching and looking at all these pictures and all this kind of stuff. And there's an element of separation there. You can't physically touch the pen. You can't physically write with it, take it out the door and say, this is the pen. I know, I like it, I'm holding it. I like this pattern. I like the way this purple piece is next to this blue one. So I like this one, so I'm gonna take it and walk away. That you can do in a brick and mortar scenario you have a little bit of a guess, a little bit of risk. You know, it takes a couple of days. It's a little less convenient to buy it online in some ways than it is in a physical store. So in the pen world, at least, you tend to see a more general rule of 20% off of the full MSRP for pens because of that element of risk and because of the factor of your, you have more competitors out there. If you're in a brick and mortar scenario and you see there's a price of a pen, yes, you can maybe look online, but you don't necessarily know what the store three cities away has it for sale in their store. So there's definitely a degree of, you don't know as much and you're, you're much more kind of catered to in that individual store you're not seeing as much kind of global competition. So it's great to be an online retailer in some ways because you can get, you can access a lot of people and you can ship all over the place, but also the world is your competition. And so it tends to kind of neutralize itself a little bit there. And I've got some experience and perspective on that. So um, let's see here. I talked about how 
you know, what makes it tough online is if you see it a full MSRP at some places and discount it elsewhere, you naturally tend to think that the discounted price is the true value and that everyone else is charging a premium. In fact, that is not the case. You're really only actually charging a premium if you're charging above MSRP. But you might be charging more than someone else. Someone else is just discounting it more than you. That's all. Um, so let's see here. Most retailers in a given region are paying around the same price for their goods. Um, you may get into scenarios, and those of you who work in retail or any type of wholesaling, manufacturing type of distribution chain, you know that obviously when, you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you're buying in huge bulk, you can usually get discounts. Or if you're a very large retailer, very large, you know, kind of scenario, you can usually negotiate lower prices. That honestly really doesn't happen, at least from my experience in the pen world. And we're kind of one of the bigger ones, I would assume, with 39 people. We probably have more buying power being slightly bigger than somebody that's just starting out in their house, right? Because we've been there too. But there's really not a bulk discount scenario, even for us. We're pretty much paying the same price as everyone else. So we have to find our efficiencies in other ways, mainly through our processes and, you know, treating our people well, keeping them around and being nice to customers so they come back and all these types of things. Um, but we're not getting really any different price than the brand new retailer who just signed up yesterday and is selling it out of their house. So it gets a little difficult there, especially as we get big and we have overhead and all these types of things um, for us to do that. So it's much easier if you're smaller and have little overhead to discount and sell. But it gets to the point where if you start to do that a lot, then you need to grow and scale and hire people and get a facility and all these types of things. Your overhead grows. Like any retail scenario, the larger you get, the lower your margin gets. And woe is us, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it does... Uh, it, it does kind of just give you a little bit of perspective when you know that like, oh, it's not because they're bigger, they're necessarily paying a lot less. When you get to the size of like Walmart, Amazon, you can pretty much assume they're negotiating lower prices. Um, but even for us, 39 people, like that is not big. That is not big in terms of retailing. Retailing big is like you have a thousand stores. That's big in retail. Um, let's see here, what else? Da -da 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 -da. I, th I think, uh, just kind of close this off, I think you're still kind of seeing some adjustments maybe in the e-commerce landscape from traditional brick and mortar stores. The pen industry in general, fountain pens especially, this may shock you, but it's not necessarily on the bleeding edge of technology. Um, so I think we lag just a little bit in terms of uh, most other you know, e-commerce. Um, I think if you're looking at uh, clothing or fashion or electronics or other things like that, um, they're gonna be much more kind of on the cutting edge. Um, less so uh, for us because we have, we're a niche, we're a hobby, we've got some legacy products and things like that. Um, so uh, you're going to see a little bit more of a brick and mortar mentality. Honestly, sometimes even, you know, for an example, some manufacturers will say, well, you can't, you can't openly advertise one price, but if you email and get a better price, that's, that's okay because that's somehow more equal. And it's like, maybe that was true in like, 2009 but in 2019 or sorry yeah 2019 that's where we are now people really they get that they know what's going on it's really just an inconvenience to have to email for a better price like can you please just say what the price is like just just do that please so there's still kind of a, a mentality around some of that carrying over from brick and mortar and seeing how things translate online so we're still kind of seeing how that evolves and it's interesting and we're very much involved in that and having that conversation with a lot of our manufacturers so uh, to summarize msrp and map help to give a floor to discounting give consistency in the branding which ultimately will provide reliability and stability to the manufacturers and retailers which is really what's required for growth and sustainability. So, um, you know, while it may seem like getting the lowest price is always the best thing for you as the customer, as the consumer, um, in the short term, that may be the case. In the long term, not necessarily. Okay? All right. Got a question from Joseph J on Facebook. Boy, I'm going long today. Joseph J on Facebook. I liked the Lamy plant tour. Any chance on doing others? Maybe Visconti. Well, Joseph, I did um, shoot some footage of Stipula, Paniter, and Natuno. Granted, they're much smaller than Lamy, um, but I've yet to edit it together. <laughs> so I went there in September with Rachel. I shot a lot of footage. The footage was so, like, I didn't go over there with the intention of shooting footage necessarily, so I shot a bunch of kind of random stuff and stuff of a lot of just like parts of Florence and Naples and random things. 
I could not in good conscience come back during the holiday season, dump all that footage on Andy and say, here, good luck trying to put all this together because it's just, just so much and I have to go through all the footage and name it all and stuff anyway. I've, I have not really honestly gone through a lot of that footage myself because we've been so stinking busy. So um, I have some of that footage that I've already shot. I just have to edit it together. It's probably gonna take me months to get it together still, um, but I've got it. Others could certainly happen, but um, I don't have anything planned necessarily at the moment. It's definitely time consuming to go and travel and shoot that and edit and all that kind of stuff. It's the most effort of anything we do here, uh, video wise. Um, but it's certainly something that I'm thinking about. Um, it's certainly something that's appealing. It's me as a, you know, I'm not only the CEO of Goulet Pens, but I'm also a product development interest of sorts. I'm a subject matter expert, a video personality, and I have some video equipment capabilities as well. So I can do some photography and video as I travel. So I'm kind of a one-man band as I go around. Granted, the editing time, like, whew, that's a lot. So Andy, I definitely collaborate with her on a lot of that. Um, but I am capable of going to an event, shooting a lot of footage myself, coming back with it, and we can produce something. That's not something that everybody has kind of as a package. Um, so it's interesting. I like doing it. It makes it very stressful when I travel because it's, I basically am never off when I travel because all do, I do all the normal business things, all the normal travel things, and then when I get back to my room at 10.30 at night, that's when I pull out the laptop and I gotta charge all the batteries, I gotta upload all the footage, I gotta back it all up, I gotta edit, I gotta whatever, it's, it's, it's a lot. So I'm usually up until one or two o'clock in the morning doing video stuff as I'm traveling. So it's just a lot. So, you know, I can only do so much of it because it just takes so much out of me. And then I'm completely exhausted when I come back from a trip. And as any of you know who travel and have young kids, I come back from traveling and it's like, I'm exhausted from the travel and all the extra work that I've done. And then I come back and my work is piled up and there's laundry and there's, I got to be with my kids and I got to relieve Rachel because she's been doing double overtime with the kids. And so it's just a lot. It's just a lot. So I just, I, I love doing it, but I can't promise it's going to be like a, yeah, every two months I'm going to come out with some Lamy tour video. It's just, it's, I'll be lucky to get one or two of those done a year. Um, but it's super cool and I love doing it. So who knows? Uh, Visconti specifically, I don't have anything mapped out or planned, but that would certainly be one of the more interesting ones to do because apparently they're in like a 15th century Italian villa, which is, I've heard is gorgeous. All right. A couple of personal questions to close it out here. One is from El Elisa, no, Elise Aldez on Instagram. Forgive me if I mis mispronounced that. What's your favorite non-pen related podcast? Um, it's interesting how podcasting has kind of like come back in vogue, right? Like audio is definitely becoming more of a thing. We turn Q and A into an audio version because it just saves you time, right? Like you can listen to it in the car while you work out, whatever. I do the same thing. Um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks mainly. Um, I don't know. I just, some of the content of audiobooks, I like the pace of it. It just works well with my brain. Um, it's more expensive because you got to pay for audiobooks. Um, I'm sure there's subscription services and stuff, but, um, anyway. I like to re-listen to things a lot. So um, audiobooks are a big thing. Self-improvement, business leadership, that kind of stuff is more in the vein of what I listen to uh, mostly. As far as uh, podcasts go, I have a couple that I listen to on a pretty regular basis. Nothing religiously. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk, big fan of his. He has his Gary V audio experience. He's putting all kinds of content in all the time. So I'll usually fire that up while I'm in the car if I want to kind of get amped or just be interested in kind of like what's some of the happenings going on in social media and marketing. Um, he's usually good for that. And he mixes in a lot of good business development. He's kind of all over the place, which is kind of where I am most of the time. Um, so it kind of tends to work with me. So he's pretty interesting. Curses like a sailor, so just be ready for that. Audio quality is usually never great because he's running all over the place and he's chewing while he's doing. He's just, he doesn't stress about it. He just goes. So, you know, it's definitely not going to be your typical audio podcast experience, but it's very entertaining and his content's legit. Um, one of the more entertaining, kind of much more produced story told ones um, is The Way I Heard It with Mike Rowe. I'm a big fan of Mike Rowe, Dirty Jobs, and he's, you know, all the things that he's doing now. But he has this very interesting podcast where he kind of tells stories and always has an interesting twist. What's the tagline in that? I think it's the, you know, the podcast for the curious mind with a short attention span, <laughs> which I think kind of fits me sometimes. So I definitely vibe with that. They're all like eight to 10 minute stories that he packages together and it's always entertaining. And of course his voice is awesome. So I love listening to that. Um, 
Another businessy kind of one is How I Built This with Guy Raz. Uh, so this is like an NPR produced one, but um, really interesting. So they interview uh, and kind of tell stories of people who are entrepreneurs or have done startups. You know, people like Sarah Blakely from Spanx and the guys who started up Honest Tea and you know, there's other things like that. Um, other other brands, the guys who did Instagram. So just, you get, he interviews them and just kind of tells interesting stories. I love getting backstories of people. That's a lot of the business, you know, type books that I like to read are not just platitudinal kind of things, but really people that are telling stories of how they did things, making all the mistakes, their thought process as they were going in certain stages of their businesses. Um, I gain a lot from that, so I like that. Um, another one that I don't listen to a lot, but I have some really interesting ones queued up in my my podcast is the TED Radio Hour. Um, I do like TED Talks. I have to be careful. TED Talks are something that's like a deep rabbit hole for me. So I, I usually kind of fall down the rabbit hole and binge on TED Talks for several hours way too late at night. And then I'm like, I got to cut myself off and I just completely go away from them for a long time. So the TED Radio Hour is kind of in that vibe too, but they do have a lot of interesting content there. Um, and then another one, this is very much more on the personal spiritual front, so forgive me for going there if that's not your thing, but um, Word on Fire with Bishop Robert Barron. So I'm a Catholic, and I was born and raised Catholic, and um, that's how I practice, but I like the, the way that he explains things on there. That is definitely more kind of if you're of that belief system and kind of like that vibe, then great, great resource there. Um, otherwise, you're probably not going to love it, and that's totally cool, um, but that's one of the ones that I enjoy. All right, and then the last question that I have for this week, this is Elizabeth D. on Facebook. She asks, does a day in the life of Brian and Rachel stay pretty consistent or does it change a lot every day depending on what's going on? We over at The Nation have surmised that you two spend more time signing cards lately. Um, well, you're right. Um, uh, about the card signing thing. In fact, I have a stack on my desk right now. So we have a goal for everybody in the company to sign a certain number of cards every week because we are coming off of a busy holiday season. And we, you know, we actually run projections on how many note cards we need um, these days because we don't want to run out. So um, with 39 people in the company writing note cards, um, we it's very easy for us. You just get busy and not do them and 20 people end up not doing them. And then you know, we run out. So we got to make sure that we're all kind of keeping up. So um, Rachel and I are, are part of that. So you've noticed on Gilead Nation, I think people post more when they get a card from us. So it probably seems like we're carrying the heavy load. We're, you know, we're, we're only two out of 39 people and, and we're not writing as many cards even as some of our other folks on the team. Um, so we are, we are writing more and especially over the holidays. Basically, I was like, well, if we're just going to sit here and watch, you know, peanuts Christmas I'll just sign cards while I'm doing it like it doesn't detract from my experience at all I've seen it a hundred times and I get to write notes and that's cool and other people get to appreciate it so we wrote a whole lot over the holidays so you're probably seeing a lot of those on Goulet Nation now um, but yeah I've got my little stack and so I write them at home and you know I wrote like 20 last night as Rachel and I were were re-watching Friends the original uh, sitcom series um, so you know just as we're tired and it's like all right I need to shut my brain off right before I go to bed so we'll watch like one episode of that write a bunch of notes and closes out the day nicely um, so yeah uh, that's on the note front thing um, so day to day does do we stay pretty consistent um, there's uh, the answer is yes and no um, there's a degree of consistency like we always have to drop our kids off and we always have to pick them up um, but but uh, lately it's like well, there's a holiday and then there's a snow day and there's a da 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 da. Anybody with kids knows that like, yes, you try to be consistent, but you, every day it's gonna get blown up somehow. Um, and then work-wise, we have certain meetings that we keep on a regular schedule. You know, we have company meetings that we do every Tuesday morning. You know, we have certain other meetings, leadership meetings that happen on certain days of the week. We try to keep them as consistent as possible because that really helps with our schedules and stuff. Um, but then there's other meetings, ad hocs and things like that, strategic stuff that comes up. You know, this thing is really important or we gotta hit this deadline and so this thing will come up and I got to shift five things around and shove this meeting in there and then that moves around and then this happens and then, oh, by the way, our, you know, whatever, something in the IT closet is beeping and, okay, let's go check that thing out. Oh, I was going to eat lunch today, but, uh, you know, oh, well. So, you know, the truth is 
we try to put some regularity to it, but really it, it changes a lot day to day for me and Rachel specifically. Um, Rachel works on, on a lot of projects, so her days kind of look different anyway. She'll go in long runs where she's working on a certain thing for a long period of time, um, and then that kind of closes out and she's into the next project. Um, me, I'm just kind of a basket case every single day. I do stuff like we do right nows regularly. I shoot Q&A like this on a pretty regular basis. And then pretty much outside of that, it just blows up in my face every day. Um, so yeah, work stuff, it's a regular, it's a work, it's a mix of regular work and project work. And we're always kind of DJing our schedules together. That's what I like to say. Um, we've been yeah, signing the note cards. I talked about that. Uh, yeah, there you go. So that's kind of it. I mean, just to give you an idea, like, as I close this thing out for you super loyal people. Um, you know, Monday, I came in, shot right now, had a stand-up meeting with my leadership team. Rachel and I set a meeting um, because we have um, our developers that we work with for our website that have some strategic projects and they need some prioritization. So her and I sat and met about that. Then I had an ad hoc meeting about um, how we select new products. We're feeling like we need to mix up that process a little bit, so we dove into that a little bit. Then I went over to our media team and we had a strategic meeting with the entire team with John, who's our director of marketing now leading that so that meeting shifted a, a little bit in its purpose and so we're meeting that and then I reviewed some emails and then I had a leadership meeting with my um, executive team to talk about some unity stuff between our broader leadership team because we want to make sure that we do that so kind of laying out for the year what kind of uh, events and stuff do we want to do together for that and then I had a quick lunch which was like 10 minutes and then I had to write the personal message for the newsletter on Wednesday then I had to prep for the company meeting which is on Tuesday I did that Monday afternoon look over my weekly one-on-one -on -one reports and some you know various things that my leaders had sent me from Friday and then I worked on emails and then I went home and then I worked more at home so that was my Monday <laughs> Tuesday I came in you know I didn't have I didn't have right now but I pounded out some emails and stuff we had our company meeting which was uh, no sorry leadership meeting then we had our company meeting which was more robust because we talked about a whole 2018 recap which Rachel and I had prepped um, and then we had a product info meeting which we do with our um, media team and customer care and inventory team and then I had an ad hoc meeting about our thematic goal because we just did our big off-site planning we wanted to meet as an entire leadership team to talk about our thematic goal which we're going to talk about with our company next week and really just kind of laying out all the plans and initiatives that we have for 2019 so just nailing all that down i answered some emails i had lunch and then i had uh one-on-one -on -one with uh, john my director of marketing and then we had a video brainstorming meeting with five of us on the team and then i met with our it guy because we got some software that we're looking to implement and then i selected q a questions and then i prepped q a and so on and so forth and then I had Wednesday, I had right now filming a leadership meeting. I had a whole lot of emails that I answered. We had a new product strategic meeting. I had a quick lunch. We talked about discontinued products, which things didn't sell after kind of analyzing from 2018 and what we should consider dropping. I shot a video on the hottest inks of 2018, which is gonna launch next week. And now I'm shooting Q and A. And there were various things that came up through the day, like I had an IT issue that came up and popped up in the middle of the day and that knocked out half my discontinued products meeting. So I had to bail on that one. So. That's pretty much how every day is for me. I schedule everything. I'm lucky if I'm able to squeeze in some emails and Instagram posts and stuff like that. But it's like boom, 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 boom. And uh, it's a really good mix. But I like it that way. I like being involved in stuff and I really enjoy getting to have a different variety of tactical and strategic kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it is a good healthy mix of things. And it's like like literally every day is like that for me. It's all mixed in there. Lots of people stuff, lots of leadership things, some IT stuff, though I'm trying to get as much of that off my plate as possible. Um, you know, lots of product related stuff, video stuff. Yeah, good mix of things. So it's kind of uh, kind of structured it to be around the things that we like. And Rachel's schedule is, is almost completely different. We're in some meetings together, um, but she is kind of in a whole other schedule and has other things going on. So yeah, we're really intentional. We have a lot of meetings, but I think if I didn't have a lot of meetings, I would be so scattered and not get much done. So that's pretty much what it's like day to day. Little, little opening of the brain, uh, Brian and Rachel Goulet. So there you go. And I think that's uh, how we're going to close out this week. So my question of the week is um, what pen color or material would you like to see revived? You know, is there some something that you've seen out there? Maybe it's not that old or maybe it's out there currently. You want to see more of it. Or maybe it was a vintage thing and you would just really love to see it brought back. 
no promises, but I'm just kind of curious, like what it is that you really kind of covet and, and would, would appreciate seeing some more of. Okay, no writing prompts for you this week. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a break. Um, but that's all I got. So be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Check out a lot of what I talked about here on GoulettPens.com because we are a retailer if you didn't pick up on that already. Um, that's about it. I hope you have a fantastic weekend, a great rest of your week. Thanks for watching and bye-bye.